Yeah, we're still in, in three. So we're going to write, <coughs> do a few more guess and checks here. Given y prime equals e to the x, find y. This one's probably the easiest differential equation. E to the x. Oh, e to the x. So we're going to guess. All right, check. Now, if you notice, the check is actually the differential equation itself. So there's really nothing to plug in because you've basically written the entire differential equation out. So we wrote the same problem three times, <laughs> basically. Yeah, basically. I mean, it's hot. it works. Yeah. True. What could I change? What could I add to this to have the same y prime below? What could I add to y to get the same y prime? Add a, a little apostrophe right after the y. No, that would be changing it to y prime. You could do a negative e to the negative x. Yep, I could do a negative e to the negative x. That would look different. So another one, negative e, negative x. So y prime is e. Oop, almost. I think that will mess up our. That was a good, a good try, though. Uh, what I was looking for, what happens if I add a constant? No. Does that change y prime? No. Nope. So I wrote down an infinite number of additional solutions right there without working very hard. So that's what we call the general solution, is where we basically leave our constant in. And then if you get some initial condition, then you can go and figure out what that constant was. So for example, we did an example with uh, the carbon 14, and we had some conditions that let us find our initial constant, basically. So if I, you have some initial conditions, you can go and find the constants. So we'll do another example. This one's a bit more tricky, although if you're clever, you might be able to figure it out. <coughs> Any brave students want to guess? X Y prime over two. So it's got to have just. So it's got to be just a function of x. So I can't put any y's over here. Uh, and if we read about what's going on here, <coughs> I could do a tiny bit of algebra. What function, such that when you take the derivative, if you multiply it by half and x, will get you back to the original function? So one way to think about this, you're basically adding a power to x. That's what it means to multiply by x. And the constant, well, it needs to be half as big. So that's making me think of maybe x squared. Probably a power function, because if you look on the left side, the derivative multiplied by x is basically the original function. <coughs> There's an extra constant to worry about. So let's try this right here. y equals x squared. So now I'm going to write y prime equals 2x. That's the easy part. Now when we plug in, there's actually two things to plug in i got to plug in for y prime and for y. So there's two things I have to plug in. So I have a y prime right here that's going to go in for y prime. And I have a regular y that's going to go in for y. So I have two things to substitute in. So that gives me 1 half x times 2x equals x squared. And we just have to simplify the left side. And we get x squared equals x squared. So this one works out. That's pretty genius. I wrote the problem. I better be able to solve it. <laughs> <laughs> it's neat. I would say it's neat. <laughs> <laughs> I saved genius for far cooler things. <laughs> Oh, this one looks way tougher. 
So here, y is showing up basically three different places. So we got a y double prime, y prime, regular y. Six more we do the big B, capital B. You could, so I could rewrite this with that notation. If I wanted to, it would be d squared minus 2d plus 1, y equals 0. I could write it like that. And if you distribute it, what's really going on? d squared y minus 2dy plus 1y. And of course, d squared y, y double prime. What rule, actually, I don't need a rule here. Oh, I already applied the rule. Did I? No, I didn't. So dy is y prime plus y. So that's how to write it with the differential operator. <coughs> yeah. So I think we can all agree this is not as easy as the other ones are. Yeah, we can absolutely. So we can fact. Like dy minus 1 squared. Yep. So that would look like, I'm going to factor it in the polynomial form here. So that'll be yeah, d minus 1 squared. Is that right? It's d squared minus 2d plus 1. OK. Equals 0. What we're going to end up doing is basically inverting these and moving them to the other side. But that takes a, quite a bit of work to get to that point where we can just invert those operators. Uh, so let's just leave this one alone for now. I'll show you some techniques that will solve some uh, equations that look like this. <coughs> so I'm going to leave you in suspense. Your book may work this one out. So now we're going to talk about the order also known as a degree and of course ODE stands for ordinary differential equation and we're going to be lazy and write ordinary diff EQ so the order of a differential equation is basically the highest order derivative All the examples above, they were either order one or order two. I think most of them were <laughs> order one, except the last one I wrote down was order two. So all it is is the highest derivative that you see. What order is this differential equation? Oh, I tricked you. It's not two. Is it correct to cancel out the y double prime first and then just leave it with one? Yep, so it looks two, but <laughs> if you look, they cancel out. So this is the exact same differential equation. So our order is really one. We're basically going to do order one first, then we'll do order two, kind of like polynomials. You do linear, then you do quadratic, and then you go to the nth degree once you leave quadratic. So that's basically the path we're going to take with differential equations. So that'd be order one. Now what we're going to do is test. So that was a vocabulary word. Uh, what we're going to now do is determine is a uh, function a solution of a differential equation. So we're going to skip the guessing part and I'm going to write down some possibilities and then you're going to decide solution or not solution just by you're not going to do the guessing you're just going to do the checking part. Oh, and one notation uh, the book uses
your book writes log and they mean ln. So I'm pretty sure they're almost always going to use a natural base in your book. Even though, uh, what does this usually mean if you weren't in this textbook? Base 10. Base 10. So the standard base this book uses is E, not 10. So just keep that in mind. Yeah, you're basically either in base 10 or base E. Those are the two standard ones. Some, a lot. Of, sometimes you're in base 2, but those, and of course you could be in any base if it's more convenient. But the, usually the most useful is base 10 or base E, generally. Computations are usually easier in base E, if you're going to be doing calculus especially. Because what's the derivative of ln x? 1 over 1 x. 1 over x. What's the derivative of log of any other base that's not E? It's ln of that base times 1 over x, basically. So the natural log has the best derivative, pretty much. So if you're going to be taking derivatives, you'd rather have natural log. All right, so our first equation, x squared y double prime plus 2xy prime plus y equals ln x plus 3x plus 1 and we got to make sure on this our x is greater than 0 or it'll mess up our uh, natural log here. So there's two possible solutions. I think one is and one is not. I'm going to write like your book does. So when I write log, I mean ln. And if I write ln, I also mean ln. Uh, <laughs> so I guess it's always it's always natural log, yeah. Regardless of how I write it, and I apologize in advance <coughs> if that screws up your engineering stuff. Uh, Do you use a lot of no. log base ten? No, no, no. So I probably won't be messing so much stuff up now. We don't use any logs or natural logs. Okay. No, we use natural logs. Do we? Some of you, Very it doesn't matter. No. <laughs> it's irrelevant right now. Not too much though. All right, I'll try to write lns instead of logs. Yeah, it's true, it does. All right, so one of these two is a solution. One of them, you obviously need the product rule. The other one, you need the sum rule. So the first things I recommend you do, I need up to the second derivative. So go ahead and find y prime and y double prime of both of those. And then once you have all that, uh, you know, plug in one set of y, y prime and y double prime, plug in the other set. And one of them should work out.
So are my y prime and y double prime right on the left? Yeah. They're good? Yeah. They seem like they were too simple. They were nice. It's too easy. They were nice. <laughs> so the right side, that's even easier. You got 1 plus 1 over x. And derivative 1 over x is one negative over 1 over x squared, or negative x negative 2. All right. So any questions on the other derivatives? You won't know if I'll answer until you ask. I was going to say, so I got that 1 over x squared, but um, the negative in prime, how did you get the negative? Just go go off that form. Oh, okay, so you have to drop. Uh, Derivative 1, 0. I skipped a step. I just did it in my head and didn't see it. So when you watch me do math, you generally want to do more steps than I do. Probably yeah. not the same number. I mean, I did everything before you even did it, so it's not like I was following you. I just did no, it. Well, regardless of if you do the work and then you watch me do it, you probably should have done more steps than you see me do. Like what I write is a minimum number of steps, in my opinion. You should probably do at least that many. <laughs> and if you find yourself getting stuck, you probably did too few steps, yeah. most likely. So, I mean, you saw me the first time around, I didn't even write that. However, it's probably a good move to write that if you're taking a derivative. But I've just taken so many derivatives of 1 over x at this point that I just skipped that step. However, most of you probably have not taken enough derivatives of 1 over x. You're getting close to that point, but maybe not quite there yet. Some of you are, some of you, it depends on how many derivatives you've taken. All right, now we're going to check. Let's go left first. So I'm going to do those green arrows like I'm a football coach. We're going to plug in there, there. It does look silly to do this, but I think it can be quite useful too. So if you got like a lighter color pencil, you can buy, I think, lead hardness of like three or four writes really light, so you can use something like that to write on top of what you're doing. <laughs> All right, so we're going on the left. So I have x squared times 1 over x plus, so the order is really important, is why I'm being careful here. I want to make sure the y double prime goes where y double prime is supposed to go, and I don't actually plug in y where y double prime is and mess those up. Uh, most of the time they'll be written with the highest order term first just like polynomials but it won't always necessarily be true so if you look you got y double prime term then the y prime then the y but it's not always necessarily in that order and then we usually want to get it in the right order I recommend put it put it in a standard order like high power on the left so medium and yeah just like you write a polynomial so we got 2x y prime Now the right side, there's no y's on the right side, so I'm just copying the right side down. <coughs> now we gotta simplify the left. We got 1x plus 2x ln x plus 2x 
plus x ln x. So we got 2x ln x plus x ln x is 3x ln x. 2x plus x is 3x. All right, is that the same? No. No, it's not far off, but we're not looking for close. We're looking for exact, so that's not the same. So we'll go ahead. So nope, that is not a solution. All right, do the exact same thing for the other side. And hopefully it will work out. So that one should be pretty much the exact same steps, just a little different form you're going to get. It's a really good time for questions if you have them. You solved it? <laughs> Alright, here we go. X squared, Y double prime, plus 2X, Y prime is 1 plus 1 over X, plus regular Y, X plus ln x equals ln x plus 3x plus 1. I think that y is supposed to be x. Oh no. Oh yeah. Let's see. 2 x. Alright. So any questions on the plugging in before we simplify? All right, so our powers cancel. We just get negative 1 plus 2x plus 2 plus x plus ln x. I'm not going to change the right side, so I'm going to be lazy and not rewrite what I'm not going to change. So negative 1 plus 2 is 1. 
2x plus x is plus 3x plus ln x, and that is exactly what we have on the right side. This is the type of stuff we're going to have on quizzes and stuff? Of course, you can have anything I'm talking about on your quiz. It's mm -hmm. Wednesday. It's differential equation is not calculus, too. It's not that bad. Because you can take this class after calc 2, right? Yeah, this is... Yeah, the prerequisite is Calc 2, not Calc 3. You're not going to see really anything you did in Calculus 3 in here. I don't think I'll ever say the word vector, except to say that I'm not going to say the word vector. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, we model diseases. We might use, like, use the vector in the disease, like the chemistry or biology disease vector. We're going to be using that here? Oh, well, look at spread of disease, yeah. Oh, Spreading cool. over time, things changing over time. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. What else? We'll look at other cool stuff too. So now we're going to look at implicit function notation. So right when you thought things were easy. So one thing with implicit functions, they're usually set equal to zero. So if I want to take the original equation way up here, I want to take the original equation that we started with and have it equal zero. So it would be very bad to just throw out all that stuff and write zero on top. So what I'm going to do instead is subtract it all over. I'm going to solve for zero. So I'm going to subtract all that stuff out of there. So what we're going to have is a new equation. Oh, it's not really new. It's the same exact equation, just new form. So we got x squared y double prime plus 2xy prime plus y minus ln x minus 3x minus 1 equals 0. So y equals f of x is the solution if, uh, and I'm going to call this function I just wrote down. So there are a few variables in here. There's obviously an x and there's obviously a y. So I'm going to put the x variable as the first input. Uh, there's a few different ways to write it. I could write it as f of x comma y comma y prime y double prime. That would be one way to write it. Another way to write the inputs, I just said that y equals f of x, so I could write it as x comma f of x comma f prime of x comma f double prime of x. That would be another way to write the inputs right there. And if you plug in this f, f prime, and f double prime, and you get zero, then it's a solution. So if zero equals to, uh oh, oh no, I used f twice to mean two completely different things. I f'd up. So we're going to call, we'll still use a little f for our uh, f of x function, but let's call this one big F. fix it. There's really two completely different functions going on. One of them is a solution function, the other one is essentially the equation, the original function that was the differential equation. Alright, so we're going to check, a di I don't want to just check the exact same one we did because it will basically be the exact same problem. So we're going to do a uh, different one. So if 0 equals f of all that stuff. And I'm going to be a little lazy and not write the of x, of x, of x part. Just save some ink. So on this one, we're going to check that. Uh, 
Let's get a little crazy here. I'm going to have a multivariable solution function. That is correct. Yeah, so all these derivatives are all dx derivatives, or ddx derivatives, I should say. So they're all with respect to x. So when we take derivatives in this problem, they're almost every derivative we take is either with respect to x or sometimes t. But pretty much we're going to be taking derivatives with respect to x almost always. So yeah, when we write y prime, or really anything prime, it's going to be with respect to x. Uh, so we're going to take the x derivative of f of x, y. If you want to use fancy calculus 3 notation that I said you wouldn't use, we'd write it like that. Now, I'm not going to take a y derivative, so it would be misleading but not completely incorrect to call this f prime. I'm not going to call it f prime because I really should be saying what, what variable this is with respect to. So I'm not going to leave it like that. All right, find this derivative. Should be pretty easy to find. We do have a tiny product rule going on. We have to be careful, I haven't even found y prime yet. y prime is going to show up twice, and I have to solve for y prime. So there's a chain rule that gives me y prime twice, so I'm going to have to solve for y prime. It is technically it's a partial derivative. Oh, yes, it is completely incorrect to say it's a partial derivative. This is a derivative of x, so y is not treated as a constant. So these y primes are not zero. Uh, and of course, derivative zero is on the right is still zero. So any questions on, this is an implicit derivative that I took. So this gets back to basically calculus one stuff. So now what I need to do is figure out what is y prime. So I need to solve for the y primes in there twice. So we're going to subtract everything that's not y prime and then factor out y prime and solve for it. I could factor 3 out of the numerator and denominator and cancel that. I think that's as good as it's going to get for y prime.
Oh good, we don't need Y double prime. I was a little worried. Alright, so we don't need to get Y double prime. So I think we're ready to check now. So <coughs> we're going to plug in now. I'm using capital F. So this is our original. Uh, before we were messing around with, with our solution function. Now we're going to be going back to capital F. And what I'm going to plug in, I'll write the regular ones first. What I really want to, F is the, uh, uh oh, we didn't solve, I don't, I can't even solve for Y. Oh, that's okay. We're just going to put Y in here, and then Y prime is that version I'm going to use right there. put a box around the big F function that that I'm using right now. So we're plugging into this function up there. So I have y squared, which is just regular y squared, minus x times y prime is now that new uh, rational function there. y minus x squared over y squared minus x plus y plus x squared hopefully equals zero <coughs> what's nice about the uh, first these products here so our numerator denominators cancel out we got y minus x squared plus y plus x squared X squares cancel. Ooh. And we have 2y equals 0. That's not good. And there's a problem somewhere. Oh, I wrote the problem down wrong. That's where the problem is. That should be a minus right there. <coughs> so I don't think that affects any of the little f like y prime stuff that we got, I think the only thing it really affects is a couple of signs down here. So now we got y minus y, which is zero y. There we go. All right, zero equals zero, no problem. So the next thing we're going to get into is general solutions, basically where we pay attention to the constant. So I alluded to this before, where you can add a constant to y and, not, and y prime doesn't change. The implicit function solutions are not difficult. What is really difficult is the notation. Navigating the way that you write things and understand things is the hard part. And implicit derivatives are not easy, but they're not terribly difficult. They're just a little bit tricky. And you're going to find, just like in Calculus 1, you're going to usually have y prime show up in multiple places, generally. Hopefully it doesn't show up more than three times, but you just get all the y prime terms on one side and everything that's not y prime on the other, factor it out. It should always show up as a product like this from the chain rule. So the chain rule gives you an extra y prime multiplied at the end. That's why they almost all work out with factoring and then dividing. So we can get into general solutions now. There were other things we did in calculus too, but pretty much we took antiderivatives. So we were basically solving equations that look like, hey, this is the derivative of y, tell me what y is. So how about half the questions I asked you in calculus two were solve this differential equation, 
And how I made it tricky was I picked X, f of x's that weren't very nice, like sine to the sixth, for example, find the antiderivative of sine to the sixth. So uh, we basically just solved questions that look like this. That was, I mean, we did sequence and series. There's some other stuff we did, but most of what we did was solve this equation for lots of different functions of x. And how do we do that? Uh, y equals integral uh, fx dx. So that was how we how we solved uh, all these type of questions. And we usually wrote it as capital F plus C. So I didn't tell you were solving differential equations in calculus, but you were solving differential equations in calculus. So now, without any preparation, what we're going to do is solve an easy differential equation. So remember back to what you did in, pre -cal in calculus class. You basically took an antiderivative to get rid of some of the derivative. So each antiderivative we take is going to knock off a prime. So we're just going one at a time. So we're going to treat both sides the same. So first thing we're going to do is take a dx antiderivative. All right, easy si uh, question. What's the antiderivative of e to the x? e to the x plus c. That plus c is important. Now, a slightly less easy question. What's the antiderivative of y triple prime? y double prime. Now, I talked about you don't need to put a constant on both sides. You could do a plus c1, plus c2, one on each side, and then add them all to one side to get a plus single constant. So I'm just going to write it as plus c instead of writing a constant on one side and the other. OK, so we're getting one step closer to y. What should I do next? Another antiderivative for another integral. So I'm going to do the exact same thing. Integral dx equals integral dx. It's really important you include the plus c in your integral. It would be incorrect to do your integral of e to the x and the plus c outside. So that plus c needs to make it inside the integral. So we get e to the x again. What else do we get on the right side? plus xc, so I'll write that as cx, plus what else? So it's misleading to write another c. So we could use a, b, any other letters. Uh, I'm going to just write uh, c1, and then we'll just kind of add one to each additional constant we get. You could use other letters, but the next letter would be d, and I don't really want to use letter d for anything in a calculus class when you don't have to, so you should really avoid using d, and e is you know, in use already. So E is a really bad letter here. And the next one's F. So yeah, <laughs> you're running out letters, out of nice letters quickly at the beginning of the alphabet. So from here, I still want to solve for Y, so we do the exact same thing again. At this point, the pattern should be somewhat clear. picked up a constant term, an x term, and an x squared term. Now we don't know their coefficients. If we have initial conditions, uh, we can figure them out. Where are you getting the x's? Is it x antiderivative? So that's the variable. Do you mean where did this guy come from? So what's the antiderivative of a constant? constant times the variable, which is x. Or, how about guess and check? What's the x derivative of cx? Yep. And then you, you, we got the extra constant. And then basically, the same thing happened again. Now, I had to be careful the second time I 
did the anti-power rule, so I got an x squared, but then I have to divide by that square. Oh. So, and then this, the same thing happened to that constant became C1x. So if I had another antiderivative, I had an x cubed, x squared, x constant. Now we'll look at initial conditions. So these can take many forms. But always involve an x value. So for for example, and this notation is going to seem a little bit strange. So this first one right here, if, uh, if y equals f of x, a notation you may be more uh, comfortable with writing, this would be the exact same as writing f of x0 equals y0. So this book and many other books use a uh, function notation on y. So y is dependent on x, so it's very reasonable to write y as a function of x, just like it's written here on the left side. So that's all they're doing on the left side. They're saying y is a function of x. Just like we use the letter f and say, oh, f's a function of x over there on the right. So it's the exact same thing. You can also write it as a point if you if you want to. You can write it as x naught comma uh, f of x naught, which of course you could write as x naught comma y naught if you want to. So lots of ways to write the exact same information. So this is when the initial condition comes to you without a derivative. That was information about y and x, how they related. Sometimes I can tell you instead of how y is related to x, how y prime is related to x. And how that will look is y prime of x naught equals some other value. And that would be the same as f prime of x naught equals y naught. It would be misleading to write it in a, as a point because it's not really a point on the graph. It's an x value and a slope. So it shouldn't really write these as points. So I was allowed to write the first one as a point because it was an x, y value, not an x slope value. And then if I have information about the second derivative, well, that's if you want to talk about what that means on the graph, that's a concavity of the graph at the x value. So that's even harder to visualize. It's not just you know, a tangent slope, it's how much bendiness there is in that part of the graph. Uh, and of course that's f double prime, x naught equals y naught. And this is the concavity. Uh, now, if I kept going, the notation looks the same, but I'm not sure what they call the next part after that. I mean, it would be the change in concavity, but whatever word that is. So after this, it's, there's really no point in writing what it might mean about the graph of the solution. <coughs> you could say, yeah, but that's, that's when you consider the position versus the uh, velocity acceleration jerk, whereas uh, that's assuming you got time on one axis and some distance on the other axis or displacement. So in a certain context, you could call that jerk. But that wouldn't be a good general way to think of it. Because you might be thinking about population changing over time and you could say the jerkiness, what that means a lot of people are dying. No, a lot of people are dying or being born would be a high slope or a high negative slope. I don't know. You'd have to think about it for a while. Um, I think you'd have to worry about very sharp turns in the graph, like a high concavity would be something scary happening. 
Yeah, something scary like the baby boomers. <laughs> yeah, or disease wiping huge amounts of people out where your population goes, things are going great, and then boom. <laughs> like that, that concavity right there is what you got to watch out for. <laughs> That's probably not a fun time to be alive. <laughs>